Uh, I, I, I usually start out with this song, because uh, especially in situations like this. Uh, it's written by a friend of mine in New York, Sam Grossman, and it's just a little celebration of, uh, it's called Happy. It's a little, little realistic celebration. Disarm Now Plowshares 5, who are headed to uh, court uh, five days from today. They, they are amazing souls, and uh, they are each uh, facing uh, very serious felony charges. And uh, if, you know, if not exonerated by, by the truth that they, they tell, in, in that in testimony, they could face over 20 years in prison. Uh, one, of, one of the charges is co conspiracy. And I just heard the other day, actually yesterday, that 
uh, one of the soldiers who was with the 5th Striker Brigade, who was responsible for the, the murder of uh, numerous innocents. You know, the conspiracy charge was dropped in his case, and he's facing instead very minor charges. But in this case, you know, not only is the conspiracy not dropped, but a number of other felonies and um, these people, all they did is enter uh, a nuclear base and essentially pray for the abolition of nuclear weapons. And uh, so something, something is very wrong um, with, with our government, the state, and, and the courts. So at this point, you know what, I'm, you know, we have a community, uh, we have one another, and I just thank everybody for coming tonight and uh, learning, learning a little bit about this case and these individuals. So I'd like to invite uh, Father Bix and Susan Crane and uh, Sister Ann Montgomery uh, to talk a little bit about, about the Plowshares action. Well, once again, it's a, it's a real honor to be with you, dear, with your community. You know, and it's so great for us to make those connections, you know, um, as we um, are all struggling for a world in which force and nuclear weapons do not dominate. We can live in peace. We can use the resources of our land so that nobody goes without what is necessary to lead a human life. So it's a great honor. I know that you work very very hard here in the Olympia area, and it's very encouraging to be a part of you to come here. Uh, so thank you for inviting us, and uh, you know, for we feel very connected to you too. I thank uh, our brother who just led off with the honor song. Um, for me, um, I have on here these. Uh, the emblems of Chief Lashai and Quaymuth, his brothers, who were both uh, from Nisqually, from this territory, and uh, they had been ju juridically murdered by our territorial governor over 150 years ago for resisting the Treaty of Medicine Creek, which was foisted upon 13 fishing tribes here, and I'm sure you're all familiar with that, but. He was a man of great dignity and great strength, a chief flesh eyes. Five years ago, this is five years ago, 150 years after his hanging, when he was hanged, and he was hanged outside of Fort Nisqually. Um, so five years ago, he was exonerated, and the state, you know, they, uh, they apologized, I guess, if you want, and they admitted the mistake that was made uh, 150 years prior to that time about the murder of him. Uh, he lives with us still strongly, I think. I feel that his spirit is very much, it's the spirit of justice, it's the spirit of, uh, he stood strongly for his people and against the encroachment, um, against the greed and avarice and the things like that that destroy all of us. So I'm, I'm very honored and very, very thankful for the, uh, for the song, the honor song that was sung prior to this. I feel very connected with that. Um, I know oftentimes Chief Lashai is buried up in the Puyallup tribal grounds right out in Tacoma there. And so I often go there for spiritual nourishment as, as um, over the years I've often gone up to the grave of Chief Joseph who's buried up in the Spilum up there coming from the Nez Pierce tribe, you know, just to pick up from the spirit of these people who have given of their own lives for their own people and whose spirit is still with us so so strongly, I feel. You know, so to not to forget that and to take that uh, with us as we go, as we go on our journey. So I've been, for a number of years, I've been involved up uh, with the Ground Zero Center from where Nonviolence up there resisting the Trident submarine base, um, where of course we're, I think we're all pretty familiar with that. And I, I work with Bernie Meyer and with Ellis, uh, Ellis Sila, and with Bruce Brown and others 
here probably, you know, in our, our attempts to speak out against, to resist the violence of nuclear weapons and which are illegal, illegal by any law of the land, humanitarian or international law. But So we've been doing that for any number of years. And, um, and I have to give thanks for that community, for the Ground Zero Center, for community there, you know, for, for the constancy and commitment of, of being there, being there. Um, and oftentimes people say, well, what have you accomplished? Well, we've been there, that's all. I can say that there's, there, we may not have been completely, you know, successful. There are still Trident missiles, or Trident submarines, there are still missiles and so forth, but we try to be faithful on it. And so I'm thankful for doing that for over the years, um, being able to do that. Um, so, and as you know, like up at, uh, at Bangor, at the Trident submarine base, there are eight Trident submarines. Each submarine is equipped with 24 missiles. Each missile carries anywhere from four to six independently targeted nuclear warheads. And these warheads, the W-76, which has 100 kilotons of uh, death-dealing destructive power, uh, six times the power of the Hiroshima bomb, and then also the the other nuclear warhead, the W-88, which has 30 times the power of the uh, Hiroshima bomb. And so this is probably there at the Trident Base. Conceivably, we have, or at least did have, possibly the largest concentration of nuclear weapons here in the, in certainly in the United States, maybe the Western Hemisphere. Um, and so we thought there was a real responsibility for us, you know, do we want these agents of death, do you want this storehouse of hopelessness to be there in our midst constantly, you know. And it's only in our gathering together, you know, and it's, it's knowing that our spirits, what we can do together, you know, is, is powerful. And we yet the, the, the climate that we live in is a climate of fear, you know, a climate of fear that's just very pervasive. It's uh, constant, that people constantly arming themselves, not only nuclear-wise against one another nations, but also individually. People arm themselves against one another. And that idea of community, that idea of us sharing and being part of the same, of the same community is, is, gets more and more eroded, you know, as, as fear grows, and as fear grows, weapons grow. You know, and it's, it's a vicious cycle, you know, and, and as weapons grow, more fear, and more fear calls for more weapons, and it's, you know, it's, a, it's an endless cycle, you know, and I, and I think it's by our in, inward commitment to one another as peace by following that light within ourselves, that is that deep, deep, deep light to, um, that calls us to peace, calls us to brotherhood, sisterhood, uh, calls us into the human family together. Uh, and I think gatherings such as this help us to do that in some way or another, you know, making we open our spirits to that, to one another, to receive the strength that each of us have to do that. And so being here is, uh, is, an, uh, is a blessing and honor on it. Well, last, um, last and then after um, I've been with uh, Susan and uh, Ann for over a year, and also we have missing with us Steve Kelly, who is a Jesuit priest from California, from uh, the Oakland area, and working with the Catholic workers there. And then also Lynn Greenwald, who is in Tacoma, and she now works in a house of transition for women coming out of prison from Purdy. Uh, she's part of the, um, the Tacoma Catholic workers, a support community for us. So. Um, I've been with those five for over the past year before we did our action together last November, November 2nd, but prior to that there was about a year's time we took and with others with us at that time too, you know, discerning where should we be, what does the time call for, you know, and uh, so both Anne and Susan come from a great experience of plowshares. I've done many, many civil resistance, bang, uh, types of actions. This was the first plowshare action that they introduced and coached me into, you know, and so, um, 
and I, I'm very, very, um, very happy to that to have happened. Um, they'll, they'll talk a little bit more about that and so, you know. Um, what I just want to mention is on the, uh, after a year of reflecting and praying and deciding what are we going to do, we decided we would go to Bangor. Um, and then what, um, what basically if we could get into where the weapons were, that was one of the possibilities that we were really strongly entertained, hoped to do. We didn't know whether that would be possible at all. So we went up there, this is on, on um, November 2nd of last year of uh, 2009, All Souls Day. We cut through the perimeter fence and got onto a road. We followed this road. Uh, we thought we were going to have to go through bushes and things like that, but we found out we could stay to the road. It was 2 o'clock in the morning and so, and that led to another road which uh, led us deeper into the base. Uh, and so we went down that and we were surprised at, uh, at the walk, I guess you'd say. Mm -hmm. um, there was a car that came by once. We all dumped into the, into the bushes there on the side, and, uh, but kept going. We followed a transmission line down for about a mile and then went up another road. All of this, you know, the, we found this out on Google, you know, that this is a, this is where the roads are, so it wasn't all that well defined or planned out, but we had kind of general ideas of where, where roads were and hopefully leading to where Swift Pack is. That's where the nuclear weapons are stored. That's a strategic weapons Pacific, um, so and that's where this, uh, the uh, stockpile of, uh, of death is stored there. So anyway, we walked and then finally uh, Susan went, did a little bit of a, a bivouac. She went out and scouted a bit and then uh, came back saying that we go this way. And uh, as we went, we looked down into this, into this area where the weapons are stored. It was all lighted up. It looked like a big prison yard. It had towers and so forth. It looked pretty formidable, you know, and I thought within myself, no way, you know, but uh, anyway. So we go down and we're able to cut through the first fence. Now, this swift pack is, is surrounded by two fences. And uh, these two fences are about 20 feet apart. And there's a road that runs in between them, a clear road, you know, to make that sort of a no person's road uh, land if you want. So we cut through the first fence and we're able to get through that. And then we cut through the second fence. Um, and uh, that tripped off a lot of the sensors. The, the, the Marines came and they had us down and they, um, we were um, handcuffed, we were hooded, and you know, they didn't want us to see what was there, you know, that we had already seen on Google, you know. But <laughs> <laughs> and so then we were questioned, after they held us there for about three and a half hours, I think, and then uh, after that, uh, they took us in and they questioned us for about three hours, both the uh, FBI and the uh, Navy criminal investigation team. Um, and then we were released. Uh, just a couple of months ago, we were indicted by a grand jury with three, or yeah, three felony charges, uh, destruction of government property, deprivation of government property, conspiracy, and trespass. And uh, so so our court date, so finally we've already had um, our, the arraignment and then uh, we've had a couple uh, pre-trial conferences. We had one today. Um, uh, Susan might mention a little bit about that. Um, but anyway, we go to trial on the uh, <laughs> December 7th um, so we want to invite any of you that want to come. We'd really, really like to have you there. That would be wonderful uh, for the support. We feel that you know that by going there, that it's, it's not about us. What it's want to do is put trying <coughs> on on trial. You know, and we need the people to do that. You know, we need the people to do that. You know, we need the voices to speak out and say we enough of this. Enough of this. You know, a, a nation that is acting 
egregiously, unlawfully, you know. And so we want to walk the right way. We want to walk the way of our brothers and sisters, and we can do that together. So I think I'll turn over to Susan. What is said is already a lot of what I want to say is that the Plowshares Movement is not an organization. People can say, oh, where's your office? You know, who do we go to? Who do we talk to? Uh, there's no membership, there's no application, uh, but it is a community of communities, of people who have, of Bix's spirit, and are, think, you know, we've done all these things over the years. We've written letters to Congress, we've barged, we've vigil, we've sung, et cetera, et cetera. All the things they say, oh, you're supposed to change things this way. But we know, we know from experience and the experience of so many others in this country, that uh, the corporations, the Pentagon, all the things we don't vote for are the ones who are controlling what happens. That we've ceased to be, as our Declaration of Independence says, a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, which, you know, really vocalizes not just a privilege, but a duty of the people. So we have to do something, we're the people. And the quotation from the prophet Isaiah says the same thing in a deeply spiritual way. They, the people, shall beat the swords into plowshares and then nations will plan war no more. But all these people from all religions, uh, cultures, everything will come together on the mountain of the Lord. There's, it's to create a oneness, a dialogue, rather than um, subduing people for our own interests and our own way of life the use of these horrible bombs. Um, the movement began uh, just a little over 30 years ago. I was part of the group that I was privileged to join a group of really experienced people when I was inexperienced uh, to go into the, this uh, pl General Electric plant in Pennsylvania that was making the Mark 12A warheads. And we, you know, it was all new. And somebody said, well, we're really doing this in the spirit of Isaiah, so let's call ourselves that. Let's make our statement that, that these are idols, as the prophets are always speaking out against idols. Um, an idol is something you place your security in. Are we going to place our security in the weapons or in our vulnerability, our very way of working together on, from the grassroots? And so that is a choice, and it won't change things immediately but working with other people who are doing all the other things we're supposed to do, change happens. We know that from the civil rights movement, from all sorts of movements that have really changed things, right back to the anti-slavery movement in this country. We didn't think, you know, we didn't know really, you know, it was the first time, okay, you go in this store, or maybe these weapons are near the loading dock over there. We got in, and when we hammered on them, one was uh, carbonized, so it was black, it's like a, one of those cones you see on the street. The other was golden. It hadn't been carbonized yet. And I thought later, well, they're just like idols. They even look like idols. Then mm -hmm. hammered on them and, and were arrested and had umpteum charges, went through uh, the courts for 10 years. We had, again, serious jail time threatened. But in the end, um, after all these appeals, they called in a judge who gave us time served and you know, we went home. People that served various, you know, months or years of jail time before that. Um, since then, there have been over a hundred plowshares actions, not only in this country, but in others in Germany, in uh, Australia, <coughs> in, uh, where else, name a couple? Belgium. Belgium, Belgium. And of course, Scotland, New Zealand. Um, and, and Scotland's very interesting because they don't particularly like the idea that tridents are are on their shores, and they don't particularly like the, you know, UK telling them this is what you're supposed to have there. And uh, Angie Zelter will be one of the speakers next week who's been involved in that those activities. Uh, my first meeting with Trident was actually where they were made in Rotten, Connecticut, because I was living in the East, and there was a really a very good movement of people who resisted there year after year during all the time that. But it's not, it used to be 18 tridents, and now uh, it's, what is it now? It's 14, 14 now. So uh, eight of them here and six in Kings Bay, Georgia. But 
they were visible then. They were out there. You saw them being built across the river. You vigiled in the cold, freezing cold. And uh, we had our first Trident plowshares action there when we went into, into electric boats. Some of us hammered on the nose cones, which were the eyes and ears of the Trident. It just looked like big soccer balls, about as tall as that ceiling, with little spikes out of it. So we just knocked all the spikes off. And another uh, three of the men went on the Trident, actually hammered on the missile tubes. So, you know, again, we didn't know what we were going to be able to do, but miracles happen, you know. You go in and doors open and things happen. Uh, so that by the time I got here, this was my fifth Trident plowshares action, I felt like I'd been called in some way to follow this beast across the country and was very grateful to the group that invited me to come in late on this action, like last spring. So, uh, and I think, you know, part of it, and I think uh, Bix has brought this out, is that we are a little community. People come in and out like, you know, I don't think it's time for me to do this yet, or, you know, they think very seriously. Be because you have to work together. We challenge each other. We have our arguments, and we learn how to reconcile them, how to come to some kind of an agreement. And people who do these actions, as you can imagine, are very different from one another, very strong personalities. So it takes all that work ahead of time because you also have to prepare not just for the action, which is maybe a few moments in time, but for the possibility of trial and prison when, again, people have all different kinds of principles and ideas uh, down to whether I stand up for the judge or not, you know, but there are ways of handling all this. And we then we reach out to the community and, and it's the support that comes from people like you that makes things happen because our action is, you know, it's a spiritual one, but it's an active one, and we just have to put our faith in other people, in God, and in the process of change, which happens in a very mysterious way, and may not totally happen till we're dead, you know, who knows, I'm 84 years old, I don't <laughs> expect to <laughs> see all the results, but as one of, the, a judge actually who was on the world court said, um, it's working, people, these people are not arrogant enough to think they're going to stop nuclear weapons, but they know they, their work, combined with all the other different kinds of work, is what's going to make it happen. And this is the way change happens. So I'm so grateful for you for being here to see a room that's actually crowded. And uh, Susan will explain more about uh, the nuclear weapons themselves. So uh, I want to give a little court update, and uh, but before I do that, I was just thinking about these tridents and the submarines, and um, I think about these uh, trident warheads as being flying ovens, you know, that come up out of the submarines and fly through the air thousands of miles, and within 15 minutes can reach anywhere on the earth and come down and incinerate whole cities. And, uh, and we know that's wrong, to indiscriminately kill a whole people in a whole city. And to not only just kill them for that moment, but to kill generations of people, to cause damage uh, to children, to babies, to, in mothers' wombs, so that uh, generation after generation have trouble with childbirth and babies are born deformed, jellyfish-like. I mean, it's, we all know the consequences of radiation and uh, nuclear weapons. And it's, it's inconceivable that we're still building them, that we still have them, and we're still threatening to use them. And, um, you know, we have this banner here that says, Trident, illegal, immoral. And it's immoral for all the reasons that Bix and Ann were talking about, you know, as we're supposed to love one another, to love our enemies, to treat other people with dignity, and certainly indiscriminate killing of whole villages, towns, cities, where, you know, there's not a whimper of life left is wrong. And uh, there's a whole body of humanitarian law, and uh, the U.S. Constitution talks about these treaties, these laws, and says they have to be upheld in every court by every judge 
These are treaties that the United States is, is, has signed as a, as a party to. And there's Geneva Conventions, Hague Conventions, the uh, UN Charter, there's the Nuremberg Principles, there's uh, the International Court of Justice. <clears throat> Basically, we're not allowed to indiscriminately kill civilians. And we're not allowed to use weapons that can't be controlled in time and space. And even under United States law, there's a section of US law that talks about war crimes, and it mentions the Geneva Conventions, the Hague Convention, says you just can't do those things. You can't indiscriminately kill people. And yet, here we have all these weapons. And it, you know, when you talk about them being illegal, I mean, sometimes people's, people's eyes glaze over because we have so many of them. How could they be illegal? But the reality is they are. And if you just do a little bit of research about law, they are illegal. And people in other countries know this. People know that we shouldn't be building them. And, no, and still, the United States has made this agreement that we would begin to disarm. Remember, there was the uh, treaty that the US made with other countries that nations that had weapons would begin to disarm them and nations that didn't have nuclear weapons wouldn't get them. Well, the US in good faith has not begun to disarm and other nations as a consequence have started to get them and the situation keeps getting worse every year. And still even Obama talks about wanting to get to the abolition of nuclear weapons and meanwhile he's funneling lots of money towards refurbishing the nuclear weapons and building new plants. And we all read about how the, the uh, warheads from uh, Kitsap Bangor Naval Base are traveling on the highways to get refurbished. So we're not moving towards disarmament as a nation. So as a consequence of all that, we say the weapons are illegal.